popularization of science in making this in making society more aware of science well uh, we like to think so i mean uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, um, I, I think that that um, uh, yes because uh, particularly in areas uh, where um, well, in my own field, Darwinism is, is, is a good example where issues and controversies uh, are, are still active, that, that, that have been active for, for, for a decade or a century or, or, or more. Uh, and so in that case, writing historically, I think, does um, help to deepen people's perception of the issues and, and certainly on to come back to the question of science and religion um, uh, I think it's it, it, I, my own writing on Darwinism uh, is, is partly concerned to um, illustrate the fact that the story of Darwinism and religion isn't always one of conflict that there have been evolutionists who uh, were um, uh, religious and saw no conflict, just as there are today. And so what that does is allow you to present a, new, a more nuanced um, uh, view of the, the current situation by showing that the popular model of conflict uh, is so somewhat oversimplified uh, and if we can recognize the complexity of the past situation and read that through into the present. So that would be an example where the history of science, I think, can uh, play a very positive role in, in helping people to, to understand current uh, I issues uh, in, in science. Um, so yes, I think we, we definitely do have a role to play there. And it also helps to sell books, too. Hay tiempo para más preguntas y comentarios. Aquí delante. Hi. Did British newspapers have a science editor or a science section like 50 years ago? Um, oh, 50 years ago. Uh, the, the newspapers are, um, in the early 20th century, are, are fairly uh, slow to do this. The, the Times uh, had a science editor who was a zoologist uh, at the period I'm dealing with, uh, Peter Chalmers Mitchell. Um, most of the other newspapers didn't. Um, until the sort of late 30s, 40s, and there's a story what is it, it, that one of them tells that uh, in 1940s all of the science correspondence uh, in the, could fit into a single London taxi cab. Um, the Daily Herald um, had uh, uh, Richie Calder was a uh, cub reporter in the late 30s who was sent out uh, by that paper, David Herald was a Labour Party paper, um, to um, interview scientists. Uh, and um, normally the scientists uh, were extremely distrustful of these reporters coming round because they'd always garble it and get it wrong and oversimplify it. But Crowther, uh, um, uh, Calder, sorry, um, was. Um, more sympathetic to them and, and, and got the, the trust of the scientists and, and wrote regularly and, and turned his articles in, in, into books. And then a little later, uh, a number of the J.G. Crowther uh, and starts to write for the Manchester Guardian. Uh, so that, that sort of thing comes in really only towards the end of the period I was uh, talking about. Before that, uh, coverage of science in the newspapers is, is pretty haphazard. It, it would have to be quite a big story. And some things did, like the, 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 the huge brouhaha over Einstein and relativity. Um, again, mostly garbled, but uh, it, that did hit the headlines. Every now and again, something hit the headlines and it did get reported. Um, but uh, until the, the sort of late 30s, it, it wasn't normal for the n newspapers to have a, uh, a full-time science correspondent. So uh, to what extent these uh, journals or 
magazines also uh, contain a uh, reference to the economic crisis of the 30s and to what extent they tended to present science as, as a way out of, or if they did at all. Oh, th this is, uh, is certainly one of their themes. Uh, they, they, um, they do not see um, science uh, as the cause of the crisis. They, 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 I mean, this is not just the left wingers either. I mean, even the, 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 the others are, are, are um, uh, see science as the, the, the solution, not as the, as the problem. The problem is that you know, science allows us to produce enough to feed and clothe everyone. Why are people unemployed and starving? And the answer is not science's fault. It's the, the, the distribution network and the profit motive. Um, and uh, the, 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 the popular magazines are probably not politically very active by our standards, but but yeah, they would certainly be aware of this. Um, they are also uh, surprisingly aware of, of um, to some extent, of, of um, en environmental and the, the exhaustive resources. Uh, there's a, quite a lot of material about um, worrying about already at this point oil running out and they hadn't realized quite how much oil there was so they, they, they in the 20s and 30s there was serious worries that the oil might be out, run out in you know in a decade or two uh, and uh, how can science help to you know make oil from coal or, 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 or whatever um, so uh, again science is being seen uh, as the the way out of the problem. I mean, in a sense, we've invented the motor car to, uh, to burn the oil, and if we burn up all the oil, then we'll have to figure out a, a way of, of um, getting it from uh, the fuel from somewhere else. So um, they, they would, uh, they're certainly you know, not unaware of what's going on around them in the economy, but they, 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 they would want to present science uh, as the, the, the solution uh, rather than the, um, than, the, than the actual cause of the problem. I, well, people, ah, okay, here. Yeah. Uh, were there any publication or magazines about social science? Or there were only about natural science and engineering and these kind of things? Oh, gosh, that's an interesting one. Um, I, I'm not an, an expert at all on the social sciences. Um, the Some of the magazines that I've talked about would occasionally include material on, on certainly on psychology, and sometimes on, on social sciences. Um, Discovery, the, 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 well, the magazine I mentioned first, because it was not exclusively science, it, it was discovery in the widest sense of the term, so it certainly would have anthropological material and some socioeconomic material. Um, I, I don't know whether there was any popular magazine specifically to popularize the social sciences. Sorry, is anybody else in the conference who knows more about that side <laughs> than, than, than me? And I can answer that question. Um, I, 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 I don't think so, but I couldn't say for certain. But certainly there's a little bit of that in some of these magazines, but it, uh, it, it's not usually a, a dominant theme. And I guess that certainly, at least indirectly, in those left-wing movements the, the, on popularization they, 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 in the 1930s. They, they would uh, be, be moving more towards a, a, a sociological critique, yeah, but it would be embedded in, yeah. in their regular uh, general material, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hi, you mentioned that uh, the book uh, the Science of Life was a very successful book. So I wonder which was the, the reason why it was success, successful. It was because it was like a very good written book. It was very rigorous. It was because there was lots of uh, advertisement behind. Uh, I don't know, do, you've, uh, do you have any idea why it was successful? And in more general terms? All of the above. I mean, <laughs> uh, well, I mean H.G. Wells was, of course, an immensely um, well-known figure. 
Um, and as I said, it was, this was a follow-up to his earlier serial work, which had sold you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, uh, enormously successful. He was uh, a, a, a very well-known public figure, and he was also a, a very good writer uh, for the, the, the uh, ordinary person to read. Um, so you, uh, you have the combination of, of, of the reputation, the skill at writing, coupled in this case with uh, a good biologist to, to provide the, the background, and uh, of a, a press that's willing to spend a lot of money on advertising uh, to, to get the thing moving. So, uh, uh, and uh, it's one of those situations where once you've got the reputation, the press will spend the money to, to publicize the next book or, or next serial work. Uh, and so it's a kind of self-fulfilling thing. I don't think the science of life was as successful uh, as the outline of history, uh, but it, it did pay its way. And of course, the, these things uh, were subsequently issued in ordinary book format. Uh, and, and then in cheaper versions and so on, and the science of life was still being, uh, I think it was still available after the war, uh, uh, still being printed. Uh, so uh, it adds up over the years as well to, to uh, considerable sales. Uh, but advertising is important. Uh, I mean, the, the, the other serial I mentioned, the, um, the Harmsworth Popular Science, uh, when that was launched, the whole front page of the Daily Mail was devoted to an advert for the, 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 the new series. So, I mean, and that's, and that's, this is a newspaper with a circulation of millions. Uh, uh, so so you know, the advertising is certainly there. And of course, when you've got that link between the, the publisher of the magazine or serial work and a major nat national newspaper, uh, you know, the advertising is for free, so to speak, uh, and in those circumstances, uh, it's very easy uh, to to, um, to promote the book, uh, and if it is well written for that kind of readership, then it will be successful. And priced right, of course, I mean, you have to get the price right. So, in more general terms, can you extract from these examples uh, which is the way for uh, science popularization to success? Well, at, at this period, um, those serials were, I think, the most successful thing. The, the magazines had only limited success. A conquest, the first one I mentioned, uh, 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 failed after six years. Armchair science staggered on, not doing too well, and eventually uh, was taken over by an American firm and just pub published reprinted American material the, in the late 30s. Um, the Discovery magazine was run at a loss. So the magazines were not very successful. And that's different. I mean, in, in Germany, there were, were science magazines selling you know, hundreds of thousands of copies, yet in Britain there weren't. So it, again, it's a, it's, it depends on the, 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 the culture and the environment. Um, the, uh, the, the books, um, the Home University Library, um, they would sell certainly tens of thousands of copies, although that they would have to add up over many years. Um, I mean, the, those self-education books, uh, they're, they're not like a bestseller, which sells you know, large numbers in a year or two and then fizzles out. Because they are education books, they're kept in print and people buy them. And so uh, over many years, they could add up to uh, a fairly respectable uh, sales but uh, never selling huge numbers in any one uh, year. Um, so it, 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 the, the serial works, I think, were, were, were probably the most uh, successful. I think Hogburn's uh, Science of the Citizen and Mathematics from the Million, they did sell very well. That's the very end of my period, just before the Second War. Um, but but uh, 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 the other big success is Sir James Jeans's Mysterious Universe about the new developments in cosmology uh, and physics, 1930. And that, again, was pushed very hard by the publisher, you know, adverts on the London Underground and so on, and that sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Uh, but that's very, very, very unusual for an ordinary book. 
Um, so yeah, it, it depends on the circumstances, but as I say, it also depends on the particular national environment for what kind of, of, uh, of, of um, format people are used to buying. I see in the room quite a number of professional scientists. And I think the question I'm going to ask is uh, one that may, some of them may, may benefit from. In your book on uh, Science for All, yeah, that's the one you discuss all these mm -hmm. things, uh, you describe the ups and downs of who, how prestigious was it for a professional scientist, scientist to popularize science. And for those professional scientists in the room, they may think, okay, is that something I have to do or something I have to get someone else to do for us? And I wonder if you could say something about you know, part of the thesis in that book of Science for yeah. All yeah. on how that went up and down and the conflicts they had with among themselves yeah. of don't do that because that's not a serious job to do. It is, that's a very important uh, point because um, clearly they were uh, substantial elements of the, the scientific community who did regard it as just not the done thing to, to, to write uh, for uh, newspapers and popular magazines. It was rather more acceptable to write the sort of self-education material. So the, the home university library, for instance, had no difficulty getting professional scientists to write. I don't think there was any... Um, uh, negative um, re response from the scientific community to someone who wrote serious educational sort of material. Uh, that could still be aimed at the general public, but as long as it, it was serious. What they did not like was writing for the, 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 the popular newspapers. And for instance, Julian Huxley, um, the, who collaborated with H.G. Wells and the, the, the thing we've just been talking about, um, he did write for the popular newspapers, uh, and uh, so did J.B.S. Haldane, and they, they did get some negative reaction. And it's certainly said that Julian Huxley didn't get his fellowship of the Royal Society for several years because, in part of the suspicion uh, of his activity writing uh, for popular newspapers. Although it has to be said also that he was spending so much time writing <laughs> popular stuff that he wasn't doing any research, which didn't help, help him get into the Royal Society. Um, so um, my feeling is that, that um, the, the, the scientific community was comfortable with um, a certain amount of popular writing uh, of a serious nature that promoted science. Um, the, the, what you mustn't do is a write in a manner that for the for the, 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 the really cheap newspapers that where you have to get so jokey and populist that you are seen to be um, you know, uh, reducing science to, to, to just jokiness. <coughs> And what you mustn't do as well is stop your research uh, so that you're, you're no longer perceived as being an active scientist. You've got to keep up the research as well as doing the popular writing. Lancelot Hogburn, for instance, who wrote the, 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 the science, uh, the Science for the Citizen used to write the thing on the train. Uh, he worked in London, but because he didn't want his family to be raised in the, 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 the smoke and, and dirt of London, his family lived uh, out in the West Country. So every Friday he'd take uh, the, the, the train out to the West Country, and every Monday he'd come back again, and he wrote the thing on the train. Uh, and, he, and apparently they had... I don't know, just why there's third class Pullman cars on the train. I never I always thought Pullman cars were first class, but when they had them in my days. But um, apparently, he, he, this was, gave him the, the sort of comfortable environment he could, he could write on the train. So he could keep up uh, his uh, research work in London during the week. And, and since he was a, a good, fast writer, the uh, sort of three or four hours uh, each direction at the weekend on the train got, got another couple of chapters of the book written so that he, he could uh, keep up his, uh, his serious work, work and write at the same time. So getting that balance right was, was, was very important. Um, but I mean, there used to be a, a, a myth 
that any kind of popular writing w was bad for a scientist's career. I don't think that was true. Uh, it was the, doing the wrong kind of popular writing, the really populist stuff that was disapproved of. Uh, but if you were felt to be um, encouraging you know, people to take a serious interest in science, then, then that was okay, as long as you didn't overdo it. Thank you. I Tiempo para alguna pregunta más, si alguien se anima. Y si no, me gustaría dar las gracias a Peter Bowler uh, por esta charla y espero que haya servido para eh, hacer pensar a la gente en el papel de la divulgación científica, en quién tiene que hacer esa divulgación científica y los que la hacen, en hasta qué punto pueden dar por supuesto que aquello que hacen es algo que la gente quiere o al principio tienen que... Eh, generar la expectativa de que es importante saber ciencia para después eh, poder divulgar esa ciencia y conocer esa ciencia. So, si me acompañáis en agradecer a Peter Bowler su charla. Gracias.